Okay, so good evening, everybody, or good whatever it is, where, wherever you are. Uh, welcome yeah. to Thursday Garden Chat, the weekly public service broadcast from Garden Masterclass. Um, before we go any further, let's just have a little reminder about events we've got coming up. We are sort of getting near the end of our live events season now, but we've got a work a second workshop at the Serge Hill Project uh, in Hertfordshire, that's Tom Stuart Smith's uh, quite extraordinary plant library on the 25th, 24th of July, and then another one on the 25th of September. Uh, so they'll be looking very much in detail at uh, perennials and pet perennial growth habits and a great opportunity to sort of get on your hands and knees and see what's going on at, at ground level. And indeed, uh, the workshop um, on the 24th, I'll be doing a Zoom presentation uh, focusing on what's going on underground. Um, then um, really after that, uh, we've got... Um, well, also some autumn events, uh, another walk at um, White House Farm. But we are beginning to populate the diary pages with our uh, winter webinar season, which we haven't actually launched yet, but we'll do, I think we'll probably do early bird tickets, don't you, Andy? I think yes, that's, that's a good idea. That's a good so idea. Very soon, yeah. very, keep an eye on the diary, because very soon we will be putting those winter online events up at a, at a some sort of reduced price for early bird bookings. Uh, we're running the naturalistic planting design course again um, to popular demand. And uh, are we going to let them know about um, our big new idea, Annie? I think so. Go on, Noel. Okay, Spill okay, the beans because yeah, yeah. you've got you've got a very exotic top on. So I think you. Yeah, need... I, th I thought I thought I thought the, the, there was a sort of party line for wearing garnet on tops tonight. So. Oh. <laughs> That's very, very, very uh, exotic. Okay, so yes, do you want to do you want to spill the beans then? Well, yeah. I mean, since we've been online since um, April twenty twenty, our output has been very much visual, and we've done a few podcasts where we've got a strong audio element, which is for members only. But we've decided we're going to be much more serious about doing podcasts because uh, I mean, there are so many people who really have very little time to, to watch anything, but are sort of driving between jobs or they're busy potting up or they're busy weeding or, or whatever. And to listen to something is uh, yeah, far more user friendly. So we, we're going to be rolling out the podcasts. On one level, we'll be looking at a lot of our previous content, uh, editing it. So it it's basically makes something good to listen to. You don't have to watch it. We'll be commissioning new stuff. We're very excited because we've got a, a commission with um, a fairly well-known writer on ecology and, and gardens who's going to be doing a podcast series for us. You'll be hearing some new voices as, as interviewers. Um, and um, uh, we are also going to be doing something that's probably much more information heavy uh, as well in trying to get as much information over uh, in a sort of entertaining way as well through, through podcasts. So keep an eye open for those um so um just a reminder that if you've never seen us before uh you can sign up to our monthly newsletter on our website and also a reminder that we do this as a public service and any donations to help with running this particular event are very uh, gratefully received um over to you annie i think to okay. introduce this panel Thank you, Noel. Thank you. Yes, well, it's very exciting this evening because we've got five guests, um, guest speakers. Um, and I'll, I'll introduce Colin to start with, Colin Skelly. And Colin, I've known you for quite a while now. And I think you were you were an attendee of various Garden Masterclass events. And then you've been great at suggesting people for webinars and speakers and, and so on and so forth. Anyway, so Colin's based in Cornwall now and was based in Cornwall. And then Colin, about just over a year ago, upped and off to America to do this incredible programme at Longwood, the Longwood Fellows Programme. And this is what tonight's all about. So um, thank you, Colin, for coordinating everybody, all of your cohorts and, and putting everything together. And, and it's lovely to have you here. So do you want to say hello, Colin? Then we'll get everybody else to introduce themselves one in turn. Absolutely. Hello, I'm Colin, <laughs> and, and Colin... it's my very great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, the other members of the 2023-24 Longwood Fellows cohort. Um, so, who wants to go next? Nathan, off you go. 
Hi, I'm Nathan Anderson. I'm the Arboretum Director at Winona State University in uh, Minnesota. Right. Thanks, Nathan. Who's next? Abby. Abby? I am Abby Lorenz. I'm coming from Delaware um, on the east coast of the U.S. at Mount Cuba Center currently. Right. Thanks, Abby. Go okay, with Maluka next. Hello, everyone. My name is Maluka Neka. I came from Ethiopia to join the Longwood Fellows Program. Back in Ethiopia, I started a landscape design and construction business, and that is my introduction to horticulture. Lovely. And, 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 and Malukan, where are you at the moment? You're actually you're in the States still, aren't you? Yes. Currently, I'm in the United States. I am in Ohio, Columbus area. Right, right. Fantastic. Lovely. So that only leaves Adam. Where's Adam gone? Is he, yeah, is he hello, there? everyone. My name is Adam. Adam Doe from Ghana. And I can see Noel is wearing something Ghanaian. I don't know whether he has some Ghanaian linkage <laughs> somewhere. His uh, dress is wearing, it's more Ghanaian. I don't know whether Noel can tell us where he had right. that. And uh, currently back to Ghana. And uh, before the Foolish Program, I was the head of Parks and Gardens Unit for the Office of the President of the Republic of Ghana. And I'm still chasing my jobs. So I'll be moving up right. And Adam, are you, are you actually driving or are you a passenger? I'm a passenger. Oh, that's a relief. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm mightily relieved. Okay, that's yeah, great. <laughs> so I'll, I'll be going into a room quickly then. Okay. We can have a very, very fruitful discussion. Okay, lovely. Okay, so that so that's everybody. Um, that's everybody on on the cohort. So, Colin, do you want to um ro roll the the presentation so that we can get to see everybody and what they got up to and what they're going to do next? Um, lovely. No, that's not it. This always happens when we do the trial. Danny. It's I know, disappeared. I know. Well, just it'll, 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 it'll be somewhere on your desktop. It always happens that when you we do the trial, it's there waiting, and then you close it down, and then it, it'll be, it'll be buried away somewhere. Okay. Just keep, keep ferreting, okay. ferreting away through your, your desktop. It'll be there. I hope. <laughs> it was there. Where did it come? I'm sure when you minimized it. Yeah, you might have done. You might have minimized it. Yeah. Okay. Let me just. Uh... Have you have you have you actually gone into share? Yeah. You have. Okay. This is all part of the plan to get Adam a little bit more time. Yep, he's in yeah. a room. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Perfect, Perfect timing. Yeah. yeah okay. Well done, Colin. There well, we go. Super. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yes, yeah, my very great pleasure to uh, introduce the Longwood Fellows uh, from last year again. So, if from this <laughs> picture here at the, at the forefront, you've got Maluka and then Edem, then Abby, then me, and then Nathan. And this is a photo at Namur's. Well, early on last year when we arrived on the program and if anyone in the audience doesn't know where Longwood Gardens are there it's about 50 minutes outside Philadelphia in the eastern uh, US very well known in the US but not not perhaps so well in Europe um, and it's the garden of Pierre Dupont and Pierre Dupont was uh, DuPont Chemical Company. He was the CEO of, of DuPont and the CEO of General Motors. And in 1906, he he purchased uh, an estate and created a garden and um, had a few trips in Europe, got interested in fountains and, and the rest is of history. And in 1950s, it, it became a public garden. Um, and as part of that, things like the Longwood Fellows Programme began to happen. And so there you see the fountains during the daytime, there you've got the fountains in the evening. So it's famous for its, its illuminated fountain displays, but also for its conservatory. And so the top, towards the top right of that, you'll see the sort of original conservatories. Um, and then you'll see in the middle of the screen, uh, the Longwood Reimagine project, where there's a, an entirely new uh, 
conservatory with with a, a big water theme, but a lot of landscaping also around it. Um, and that is going to be open in November this year. So it's it's a huge project that we sort of saw being created during our time there. And that sort of situates it within the wider garden because there's, there's a lot more, a lot of outdoor gardens out in the meadow area and so on. And I'll just put this seasonal highlight slide on while I sort of describe the program a little bit more. Um, so the Longwood Fellows Program has been described as a sort of an MBA style uh, program for sort of, and it's described as for high potential individuals for high impact roles within public horticulture. And it tends to attract sort of mid-career sort of professionals, not exclusively, but it, it tends to. Um, and it's 13 months long and it's 13 months because it's bookended by the American Public Gardens Association conference. So when you first arrive, sort of May, June time, um, you will go to your first uh, conference and ours was in Fort Worth. And then you at the end of the program, you present at the APJ conference, wherever it is. And ours was at Boston. So we ended about three weeks ago now at Boston and giving um, our talk and our talk on uh, from mission to impact. So you produce a little booklet as well at the end. Um, and it's a very well resourced program. So there's a stipend, it's a paid program, uh, there's housing. And one of the unique sort of features of the program is that um, you live together in, in a house. And it's, it's a nice house, there's, you know, there's plenty of room. Um, and there's a, the cohort is between four and six. So we had a cohort of five, but it can be less and it can be more. Um, and the structure of the year looks a bit like this. So at the beginning is kind of getting to know everyone getting to know Longwood and, and getting to know the teams there. And then you move on to uh, what's called the core curriculum. So uh, that's people coming in um, to, to teach you various things, nonprofit, finance, governance, um, loads of stuff. Um, and also visiting gardens as well. But that kind of carries on throughout the year, but it's, it's quite front loaded. And then in February, yeah, you get to go on field placements. That's a two month placement at another garden. And we will all tell you where ours were. Um, and so if you're from the US, that will be international. But if you're an international fellow, that means somewhere else in the US. And as I say, you end up um, at the end giving a uh, paper at uh, the American Public Garden Association Conference and a little bit of a plug for our for Mission to Impact. So as a QR code, then you can get a digital uh, copy of our project. Um, and we spent a lot of time working on this. We came, you take about three months to actually uh, arrive at the idea. So on the first conference, you get ideas together about what you're going to work together on. And then through the year, you work on, on the project and uh, produce a, a physical copy, but then you also give a paper as well. And if anyone's interested, um, they're currently recruiting. So uh, apply by July the 31st if you're interested. And there's some um, the, the, the website and the program director's um, email address, Sharon thompson -Awak. So there you go. And this is us about three weeks ago, um, our final fountain show, um, which was quite spectacular. So a lot of happy memories from there. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to launch into um, our individual descriptions of our year and, and how we're going to do it. We're going to talk about where we came from, our top learning point from the year, our favourite free gardens from the year, where we went on field placement and what we're going to do next. And without further ado, I will allow Abby to talk about her year. Thank you so much, Colin. It was a great introduction to our very rich experience, but only scratch the surface. And I hope us kind of sharing a little bit about ourselves will start to give a little bit more context. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm Abby Lorenz. I originally, before the fellows program, was in Chicago at Lincoln Park Zoo, which is pretty close to the downtown area, a free zoo um, that has a spectacular amount of gardens and a natural area to the south of it. So I was in plant records and horticulture programs. So I was tasked with making sure we had records and data on all of our plant collections and plants themselves, as well as um, making sure that we were communicating the amazing things we were doing through our educational programs and tours. So with my experience at the zoo and seeing the impact that people interacting with plants and plant collections and nature has, I really wanted to expand 
um, what my influence was on organizations and really bring plants to more people. So I think that's what I walked into the uh, into the fellowship with that goal. And uh, Colin, if you take us to the next slide. During the program, I think my largest takeaway was really how to become more effective on that focus towards bringing more people to gardens. Um, I really centered my leadership practice on creating spaces of public gardens as spaces of belonging for others to really feel like they can be seen, heard, and um, find a sense of home uh, in, in gardens. I really focused my leadership around three questions of, am I asking the right questions? Am I listening to all voices? And am I looking at problems as opportunities for growth? So that's really what I'm taking forward into my leadership career. And this photo was a great day where we met with um, the greenhouse team at Longwood and got to ask a lot of amazing questions and, and hear about their stories. Colin, uh, next slide. My field placement was in the UK. As a domestic uh, US-based fellow, I got to go internationally. I chose to go to Northumberland to the Annick Garden uh, up on the Northeast corner. And I had a wonderful experience, even though it was February and March, it was very wet and cold, but I, the people really uh, stood out and came through. And I focused on the first half, I was looking at their programming around February half term. So they had a series of different events and activities for guests. And I looked at how they were interacting with those experiences and what their takeaways were from that week. And then the second half of my time, the second month, I really worked with the community and education team, looking at all of the wonderful programs that they do within the community and bringing people to the garden. Um, on this side of the slide here, there's me and the Climate Action Program Manager. We were taking care of the bee colony, which is part of their community programs and climate action programs. Next slide. Three of my favorite gardens, which we're all, I'm sure, are uh, <laughs> having a hard time choosing, but I chose these three gardens as really pivotal points in my year that really started to continue to expand what I saw the opportunities and potential of public gardens really being. Uh, the first one I have shown on the left-hand side of the screen is Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, New York. This really changed my mindset on what a cemetery could be. Um, it's not just a place for people to rest, but a place for beautiful gardens to grow and what that impact of meadow spaces and additional gardens in a space as a cemetery is. We do know them as beautiful spaces for very mature, um, wonderful trees, but really expanding that palette into perennial herbaceous material was incredibly stunning and really struck me and uh, as something that was a great opportunity for gardens and cemeteries to really look at and monitor the biodiversity and expand those spaces. We're looking at um, that kind of scientific data. In the center of my slide, I have Culpeper Community Garden in London. It was a space that I visited right after my field placement and I was able to kind of just stop by on a volunteer day and really be impacted by the community, surrounded by the people volunteering and working there and the people that had allotment spaces um, and being a community garden that has been a part of that space for many years now and just seeing the impact and the overwhelming amount of um, knowledge and sharing and potential in that space was something I hope to again visit and it wasn't just the plants and the beauty of the space it was really the people. Uh, the last garden that I have highlighted was Oak Spring Garden Foundation in Upperville, Virginia and that was a space that has um, a lot of retreats and classes and for me what's really besides the design and the beauty of the space uh, it was that being a garden as a source of artistic inspiration was really what struck me about um, the purpose of that of that garden and what it could be. Uh, next slide. So now that we are wrapped up um, this year, I have landed at Mount Cuba Center, which is in Hokesson, Delaware, near Wilmington. I am originally from the East Coast, Eastern Shore, Mid-Atlantic region, about an hour south of Mount Cuba. So 
Longwood and Mount Cuba have really brought me home closer to family and friends. And it is an incredible, exceptional native plant garden focused on the Eastern temperate forest. And it has a mission of sharing the inspiration of native plants to everyone and the, the habitats that sustain them. So it's a very mission-based organization, which is connected to our project and the work that we were doing. And I'm really excited to see how this organization continues to fulfill that mission. And I am the currently the plant records manager here. So I've been looking at how their systems and structures really support this collection and how we can share that information with more people. Okay, thank you, Abby. Maluka, take it away. <clears throat> thank you so much. Uh, so for me, I think uh, my journey into public horticulture and leadership in general in public garden started through entrepreneurship in the green industry. Uh, I have been always passionate about the outdoor landscape and plants and gardening, growing up, especially in a very beautiful uh, natural landscape surrounding. Uh, but gardening has never been something that I pursued or even considered as a profession. And it was when I moved to the capital city that I could not stop complaining about the lack of well-designed functional green space in the city. I think because of my upbringing, connecting with nature, and then moving to a city that was not really designed in that way of uh, bringing nature into the space made me a lot more aware about the beauty and the natural landscape uh, lack in the capital city. And that was when I ventured into the entrepreneurial side of starting a professional landscape and construction company, Topia Disababa. At the time, it was one of the first one because even the licensing process was a very long process to get it. And that also gave me that introduction to professional ornamental horticulture and landscape design. So that was how I got into the public horticulture industry in the first place. Uh, next slide. But with that also, uh, here you can see one of the garden that we, uh, we designed. It is uh, one of the... I think something that I feel very proud and uh, happy that as a business, we get to build this uh, garden or park under a bridge, which used to be a, a waste or uh, garbage dumping area with a private client donation. We turned it into a green space that have a children playground, uh, a cafeteria, and a fountain garden, and then a very cool, nice place for people within the city to enjoy. Uh, which was one of the projects that we did under the landscape design and construction company I started. But my journey did not just uh, stop only with uh, the landscape design and construction business, but I venture more into also any green related environmental concept and ideas about making spaces, especially cities, into green and livable space. So those logos that you see here, uh, Abalo is a, a plant nursery indoor plant, uh, also an, an indoor pot plants business that I started with my wife and my brother. A great hiker, Sitoka, is also another hiking business that I started with friends to get out of the city on a weekend so that they could connect more with nature. And the other uh, one is a bike Sunday event that we started in the capital city as well to make Sundays uh, free from car streets so that kids in the neighborhood can go out and have more exercise and also appreciate the outdoor environment. So my journey basically ventured more into the green industry and then also enjoying that connection from uh, plants to people. So that was my pre-fellowship experience. And uh, next slide, Colin. So through the fellowship, I was a long good garden program program. Only in the last year alone, I was able to visit about 50 public gardens across the United States, maybe about 10 or 11 cities. But what is very interesting about that for me is in Ethiopia, there was no public garden or a botanical garden or an arboretum in that way of uh, the way you understand or see here in the United States or anywhere else in the world, probably. So this introduction by itself through the Longwood Fellowship Program is one of the biggest experience for me that exposed me what the public garden industry is like and then how plants are actually intertwined in the city space or in the community space and that connection and value adding to the, the to the community 
So through the fellowship program, on top of that introduction to public gardens, I was also able to refine my leadership journey and really refining my what values and philosophies I have as a leader and how important that is for me going forward as a public garden leader. And one of the most challenging thing to do is to pick your favorite gardens, especially visiting that many garden. And some garden have this amazing and extraordinary beauty in some season and other gardens are like tree museums and you can't compare them with the annual or perennial garden because their aesthetic and environmental value is different. And some gardens are also very well uh, ecological garden in a way of like native plant introduction that you want to maintain all the time. So uh, while going through this process of like, what are my top three gardens? And it's been changing throughout the year. Uh, but finally, I think I can refine it to these three beautiful gardens that I have put here. One of them is Longur Garden. Longur Garden has its own unique beauty in all seasons somewhere. When other gardens are seasonally dormant, you can enjoy the uh, greenhouse that have unending beauty and display throughout the year. And then the annual flower garden is another area that you enjoy. In some way, it has a very evolving beauty that will never get, uh, uh, what, what, how could I say that? Uh, you, never get, get, you never get bored of watching it changing every time. I remember all the time. Uh, when we didn't go to the garden for uh, maybe two weeks, we feel like what has changed? Let's go back to see what has been changed now because the, the, the plant display has changed a lot every maybe two, three weeks time. So that was one of my favorite one. Uh, and then the other one is Chanticleer. Chanticleer is, I think uh, it's very hard to describe how beautiful Chanticleer is in words because the experience by itself is not really something that you put in words. And the last one that I have explored, like in our visit in uh, uh, Boston area, this uh, APG conference three weeks, four weeks ago, was a Costa Mean Botanical Garden. I've never been there before, but the moment I saw it, I know it's one of my top three pick from all the gardens that we visited in the United States. Uh, next one. My field placement was at Holden Forest and Garden that was in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, I think that was one of my uh, rich experience as a Longwood Fellow because the uh, field placement gave me the opportunity to uh, connect with the garden leadership and then explore a lot of uh, strategic planning, revenue generation ideas to the team. And I was also able to uh, design focus group questions and then engage with the staff and lead focus group discussion, compile findings and share those findings with the uh, leadership team in areas of revenue and a strategic planning process, which gave me uh, in some kind of overlap with my experience as a business leader, but at the same time, how that can be implemented within the public garden industry of generating revenue and uh, strategic planning and the leadership team being primarily from the uh, former fel Longwood Fellows. They also have been a very good support. In that way, I have a much more uh, uh, flow in my communication and then also given a lot of opportunity to explore and learn a lot from the garden. I think for me, more than what I have given through that uh, film placement to the leadership or that my contribution to the garden, uh, what I've learned how leadership is being actually implemented by attending a weekly leadership meeting, engaging with different leadership staff was one of the highlights of my journey at the field of placement. And I was really grateful for that opportunity as well. Uh, last one. What is next for me is uh, currently I am in the United States, uh, Columbus, Ohio area. Uh, I, I came from Ethiopia. I have all those businesses and nonprofit that I've started are still uh, ongoing and I have business partners and different leaders who are running those businesses. So one of the things I am planning to do right now is bridging the knowledge and the experience and the network that I have gained through this year back to Ethiopia so that we can continuously build on those experiences and connection that I have gained through the year. But at the same time, I'm also planning to stay here a little bit longer to gain a lot more experience and also contribute in the industry and kind of uh, cement my uh, learning opportunity through Longwood into 
uh, long-term knowledge and uh, experience within the United States. So in this chapter right now, I'm applying for different jobs, interviewing, and then trying to see how that would unfold in the next few weeks time. So that is my journey. Thanks so much. Okay. Okay, Nathan. Thanks, Colin. Uh, again, I'm Nathan Anderson. I'm the Landscape Arboretum Director at Winona State University, which is in southeastern Minnesota in the Midwest of the United States. Um, the Arboretum there is a relatively new designation um, as of uh, 2014, so we're only about 10 years old. I've been here five years. Um, the campus is uh, uh, about 7,000, a little under 7,000 students right in the heart of Winona, which is a small rural community. But as you can see from the, the photo, the top photo, it's nestled um, along the Mississippi River um, between 500 foot tall limestone bluffs. It's called the Driftless Area of the Upper Midwest, which is a really unique geological area um, that uh, overlaps four states, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, and Illinois. Um, it's called the Driftless Area because the last glaciation um, missed this particular area. And so there was not um, a real leveling of the topography that happened in the rest of the, the Upper Midwest and um, didn't, um, basically it's driftless, it didn't deposit glacial drift in this area. So the topography and geography is really interesting. Um, there's a lot, just the natural beauty is wonderful. The campus is about 150 years old um, and there was a, a groundswell of alumni support to designate the campus as an arboretum. We have over 1,100 trees um, as part of our collection um, and we're quite proud of the fact that we um, we have examples of 52 of the 53 native Minnesota trees represented on campus. We have a number of um, what we call gardens of purpose that have different um, meaning and demonstration on campus. And we serve not only the campus community, but the um, greater Winona community and also the regional community of southeastern um, um, Minnesota. I'm coming from a background as a landscape architect prior to taking this position. So I have been pivoting my career and when the opportunity came to apply for the Longwood Fellows Program, um, I was really fortunate to, that I was able to participate because not only was I at a um, kind of a critical juncture in my career and, and um, was lucky enough to be uh, given the opportunity to take on this director position, but I also felt the need for edification of a lot more um, of the industry of public horticulture personally. And then given the youth of um, my particular institution, being able to have exposure to all the resources of the Longwood program and everything that you're hearing from all of us in terms of beyond Longwood with the rest of the public garden industry, um, it just was a, a really critical and wonderful time for me to um, be able to take a year sabbatical from this position and uh, take advantage of the program. Uh, next slide. Um, I'm going to jump off with my three top gardens. And again, these are Sophie's Choice. Um, really, really challenging to ask us of this as well. And just like um, it was mentioned earlier, um, it, my top three can change given any particular day that you ask me. Um, but if I had to commit for this presentation, I too selected the Coastal Maine Botanical Garden um, in Booth Bay, Maine that we just experienced a few weeks ago as part of the Boston APGA conference. Um, it's uh, a relatively young uh, garden as well, opened in 2007. It's about 295 acres. Um, it has about 3,600 lineal feet of tidal shoreline um, along the Atlantic Ocean. Um, in particular, the two of the things that I find found, I picked my gardens particularly just because of the wow factor. And I hope that this, our audience today would appreciate the wow factor. This, this image, which is very similar to what Mulliken had shared is of the children's garden which um, is about two acres and it, it's inspired by children's books by main authors, um, including um, E.B. White who wrote Charlotte's Web. And so it's filled with a bunch of whimsical uh, interpretations and uh, spaces and these follies um, for, that are scaled for kids, but it's kids at heart as well. It was just an enchanting part of the garden. Also, I, I would note if you get a chance to go there, there um, the, the Garden of Five Senses 
um, which again is about an acre and highlights again our, our five senses in different ways through the experience of that particular part of the garden. It was just phenomenal. Uh, next slide. Um, and we we saw it on a particular rainy day, which seemed very appropriate for a coastal uh, a coastal garden. And as you know, just colors pop even that much more on those rainy days. And so the atmospheric quality of it just really stood out on that particular day. And I think it why it's why it stick, stuck with me uh, to this point. Next slide. And then again, just for sheer wow factor, Winter Tour um, Museum, Garden, and Library in Winter Tour, um, Delaware, again, the northern tip of Delaware, not too far from Longwood Gardens, was a highlight for me. Um, it's another estate garden, not unlike Longwood. Um, starting out, it was it's Henry Francis DuPont, which is a, a, a relation of Pierre DuPont. Um, it has one of the largest collections of uh, American furniture and decorative arts is what um, Henry Francis was known for. But the estate is also this fantastic garden. If you get a chance to go there, plan your trip for around the first week in May when the azaleas and rotos are in bloom. Uh, they have an area called the Azalea Woods, which this is a part of. Literally, they put those white arrows out so you don't get lost because you can wander around in this amazing floral utopia um, for as long as you want. And it's just completely magical. Um, next slide. And at that same time, the primulas are uh, in full bloom. This is in an area that was basically a quarry for the estate on site, a small kind of private quarry that has been reclaimed. Um, and this is when it's at its peak. And again, in the first week in May, um, just phenomenal. And there's a slow, a slow seeping uh, water um, source that trickles through these primula as well. Just a phenomenal experience. Uh, next slide. And then my third um, garden for wow factors is Hamilton Gardens, which is in New Zealand. Um, it's about an hour and a half south of Auckland on the North Island. Um, and again, this place just spoke to me from my landscape design background. Um, it's um, a, a large public garden, um, but what's particularly phenomenal about it is that it has these 18 enclosed gardens that are thematic. Um, the, I had a chance to meet with Gus Flower, who is the director, and Peter Sergal, who is the, the creator and designer and original manager of this garden. And it's he, um, Peter describes it as a garden of humanity. Um, it's basically a museum of garden themes that documents 4,000 years of civilizations um, basically reckoning with the natural world. And uh, there's three different nodes within the garden that are these courtyards where it basically becomes a choose your own adventure. And you go through one of those thresholds and it'll take you to uh, next slide. Um, that can take you to an, an ancient Egyptian garden. Um, next slide. Um, it can take you to an interpretation of an English cottage garden. Next slide. Or the Italian Renaissance. Next slide or an Indian char bag uh, garden. Um, there's 18 different enclosed gardens that each have a unique theme. Uh, Peter's actually designed 14 more that even though he's retired, he hopes to help shepherd um, into the future um, as this garden continues to grow. It's just, um, it's it's a, a, you know, a phenomenal place to think about design and garden design and the history of garden design. Totally encourage you if you get to that part of the world to look it up. Next slide. And then my field placement, I was fortunate enough to go overseas also. And I, the reason I was in New Zealand for the, to see the Hamilton Gardens is I was placed at Auckland Botanic Gardens in Auckland on the North uh, Island. New Zealand was always on my bucket list. I was so fortunate to get to go there um, during their summer um, in February and March. And uh, next slide, I was again, the Botanic Gardens there um, are, an amazing um, example of this public um, public park botanic garden um, kind of model, which is again, where I'm coming from. That's how we function at Winona State. We're open to the public free. Um, we're as much for our immediate um, guests as we are for the community at large. Um, they function, they have 1.2 million visitors. <clears throat> 
here and have um, these uh, fantastic displays of native plants. And next slide. Um, being a Midwest Midwesterner um, in the United States, where we're, if you're familiar with the USDA zones, we're zone four. Our, our, our plant palette is this big, and to be in New Zealand where the plant palette is this big was amazing. Um, there were some things that were familiar, like the upper left with their perennial uh, border gardens, but then um, their rose gardens have been adapted to uh, incorporate native plantings interspersed without. It's, become, it's becoming more of a, a unique way to um, display roses. They have a large Hebe collection, which is the lower left um, shrub uh, palette, and then a really considerable aloe collection um, that uh, was donated to them, which is just phenomenal. Uh, next slide. And again, the, the plant palette, um, what I appreciated about Auckland Botanic Gardens is that they are geared towards um, educating home gardeners, first and foremost. And so they have a Plants for Auckland program where basically they highlight plants that do well and are something that is easily adapted for home gardeners. Um, and along with that, they're also highlighting the amazing exotic, um, well, for me, exotic blooms of the native culture, native plant cultures. Um, again, um, their programming um, opportunities for uh, having being free porous borders, they have so many people that are coming just for a park experience that can be engaged um, on a more deeper level through their interpretive activities. When I was there, I was able to help work on doing some of their research on community engagement, who they're actually uh, reaching right now and who they want to be reaching and how they can reach those people, maybe that aren't plant people that are coming through their borders. Um, I was also able to have conversations about their next steps in master planning. Um, in particular, they are um, working hand in hand with the native indigenous Maori people in New Zealand and thinking about uh, the next step of creating a traditional Maori garden on the last five acres of undeveloped land that they recently obtained that's adjacent to the, the garden themselves. Um, and then also I was able to have conversations about their sculpture in the garden program they have every uh, two years and uh, work on their, their finalizing their presentation guidelines for their horticulturalist team. So I got a rich overview in terms of all the different departmental um, op operationally, um, what's happening, but also um, community engagement wise, what's happening, which is all very applicable to me coming back to my home garden. Uh, next slide. And again, um, I just walked around with my jaw dropped saying, what's that plant? What's that plant the whole time that I'm there? Um, it, was, it was a phenomenal opportunity that, that uh, again, Longwood made happen for me. And next slide. And then um, this is my, my kind of next steps in terms of where I'm coming from. My biggest lessons that my takeaway is um, from the years that leadership is a willingness to go towards, um, which is a very, simplistic kind of distillation of what I think leadership means. Um, it's for me, what I obtained from the program is basically to lean into um, the skill set that I have, but to have the confidence and, and the bravery to um, bring others along for the journey. Um, and so all the resources, again, that I was able to um, experience at my field placement in Auckland, but also through all the other gardens that we visited over the years, over the, the year program, and what Longwood gave us access to through all their department um, immersion and exposure, um, is what I'm bringing back to my returning to um, Winona State University and helping, again, this fledgling institution um, take the next steps in terms of, with our limited resources, thinking about how we can grow our community engagement, how we can grow our physical presence and how we can be a resource for um, the diverse programs that are offered at this liberal arts college. Um, Longwood has, has helped me refocus and um, kind of fill in some of the gaps in my um, leadership um, position uh, and allowed me to uh, uh, basically double down on why I'm here. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity. I believe that's it for me. Thanks, Thank you. Adam, are you there? Adam disappeared. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Colin. Thank you. Ah, <laughs>
Um, so Colin, can I come in now? Go. You your turn. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So uh, my name is Adam Kojodo, good fellow, currently back to Ghana, Accra, and uh, hoping to go back to my job. And uh, Colin, next slide. Yeah, so before the Longwood Fellows Program, I was the head of Parks and Gardens Unit of the Office of the President of the Republic of Ghana. And my role was leading a 70 member team to design, maintain, and sustain the gardens and landscapes of the presidency and also make sure that the environment is kept clean and serene. And when I came into the Longwood Fellows Program, it's been a journey of 13 months with full of experiences and uh, also building relationships with uh, other four incredible individuals, very amazing people. And uh, it's been a 13 months of fun and learning. And amongst the learning processes, as uh, Colin highlighted earlier, we did a lot of uh, classroom engagement, we did a lot of food visits, we did a lot of garden visits and also had some salons, leadership salon programs, and also did some uh, thought leaders did this at Longwood. And one of the striking moments were also living together and cooking together, having fun together. And, uh, unfortunately, there's a video I cannot play here. Maybe Peter who could see that video of how we're having fun and playing certain games. So uh, next slide, uh, Colette. So my three favorite gardens, uh, the first one is Chanticleer Gardens uh, in Philadelphia, uh, among the 13 miles radius of gardens uh, in Philadelphia. So uh, Chanticleer is more like a pleasure garden. And I think uh, Annie has been to Chanticleer before, he knows how it looks like. It's a beautiful garden, a well landscape, beautiful plants and seasons. And uh, my second uh, favorite garden is Atlanta Botanic Garden. Uh, the, uh, I'm inspired by Atlanta Botanic Gardens based on two things. The first one, how they're able to activate a 30 acre land gardens in the middle of Midtown Atlanta and how they're able to bring in programmers to actually pursue their uh, mission statement and activate it and make sure they're aligned to their programs and activity. And my third one is Mantuba Center, uh, which is also one of my favorite gardens in Philadelphia in Delaware. Parks in Delaware. And, uh, it's one of the places I love because uh, they've used native plant species and they're promoting the use of native plant species in the landscapes. And they have these uh, trial programs. They do native plant species in northeastern United States and then also share that knowledge and experiences with other nurses within the area and also spread across this research funds they do in their gardens with native plant species. And they're actually activating their uh, mission statement and making sure it is aligned to what they do with native species in their garden. Right, the next slide. And I did my full placement at Atlanta Botanic Gardens, uh, where I did a, a shadowing of all the various sections of the gardens. I worked with all the VPs of the various uh, departments, from marketing to horticulture to uh, facilities and all that. And my focus was on biodiversity and conservation, where I worked closely with the horticulture and the research and conservation team. And Atlanta also does a lot of work when it comes to plant conservation and biodiversity research in the United States and globally. And they have the Southeastern Center of Conservation, and they are currently leading on the Global Consortium of Magnolia. And they're actually helping to save some of the magnolia species. And, uh, they are using some of their research to influence policy and how the uh, magnolia species that are extinct can be conserved and bring back into the world. So that was one of the things I worked closely with in Atlanta Botanic Gardens on conservation and biodiversity. I also work closely with uh, the International Plants Exploration Manager, named Scott Monahan, and he does uh, most of the plant exploration in Sapnam, and he brings in plant species that is trial in their Gainesville site, which is about an hour drive from Midtown Atlanta. And they evaluate all these plant species 
and how they can be used in the landscape in Atlanta and other places in southeastern South United States. And this is where I did my faith placement. And it was really uh, revealing to understand how a small garden can influence uh, the issue of conservation and biodiversity globally. Yeah, next slide, Colin. So what next? Uh, I'm looking forward uh, to going back to my position as head of Parks and Gardens Unit uh, of the Office of the President of the Republic of Ghana. And for some three things currently engaging the power brokers to make sure I get my job back. And one of the key learnings, as, along with Philip, was three things I learned people, intentionality, and storytelling. So I'm using the people skills I've learned in this uh, program as a fellow to engage people who can get me back my job. I've been having a series of meetings for the past two weeks now, and it's been very fruitful. And uh, on principle, uh, Verbal, I want to break this news to our cohort that my job is, is coming back uh, verbally. I'm just waiting for an official letter to confirm me as the head of Parks and Gardens Unit of the Office of the President. So, in principle, verbally, it has been confirmed. Just waiting for the letter to come. So, one of the things I also learned was intentionality. I was being intentional of coming back to engage these people to get back my job and also telling the story of how I spent my time in 30 months with the United And this has really yielded results. And I wish to thank Colin for this opportunity to share with the world. Next slide. Yeah, so thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share with you my team. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. So on to me. Um, so my background is obviously from the UK uh, and from Cornwall in the southwest of the UK and. Um, my experience has been a coastal garden, so at St. Michael's Mount, a uh, nursery manager of a, a succulent nursery. And then on to the Eden Project, uh, where I spent uh, five years in, in various roles. Um, and and since then, bef just before the, the Fellows Programme, uh, working as a consultant on, on a few different projects, one pollinator path maker, and then another at Eagle's Nest, so the garden of Patrick Heron. Uh, the abstract artist in in the far west of Cornwall, windswept um, moorland garden. Um, and my learning, so Longwood spent quite a lot of time trying to ram some strategy into us and and uh, sent us off to ha Harvard Kennedy to, to to learn some stuff, and uh, and it kind of worked. And um, and so the the big my top learning was if you look at this logic model, the difference between outcomes and impact. So. So there's the stuff that you do, and then you assume that certain impacts are, are following on from it. But and, and the key is not to assume and to, and to try and to work out whether the outcomes that you're, you're, you're putting out there actually result in the impact you want want to have. Um, so you'll see all this influence in the mission to impact uh, booklet that I was talking about. Um, my top three gardens. Okay. I was just interested to what I'd, what I'd chosen. I couldn't remember which ones I had. So Chanticleer on the left there is uh, top, uh, up there. And I think that's been on a few of ours just because it, it's such a special garden. And, and it's the only garden, when I look back through my files of photos, where I had sort of separate into April, May, October, all the others just were in one general file. So I think that shows its impact. I mean, every time you went there, it, it, there were just something else to see. Um and and it's really a, a sort of each each of the parts of that garden are, are special in different ways. So that's that's number one. Number two is Bartram's uh, garden. And this is the garden of uh, John Bartram, who very famously sent back lots of uh, North American plants, some of the original introductions to the UK. Um, Liriodendron, things like that. And, uh, and and that's his house, basically, uh, 17th century house right in in um in the suburbs of, of philadelphia and 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 really it's not a it's not a, a a garden in the sort of fine sense it's it's a community garden um and it really sort of serves its community so although it's got this historical focus 
it actually has a very contemporary role in serving its community. Um, and there's lots of programming around and, uh, you know, learning to grow and allotments and things like that. Um, and then on the right hand side is uh, a photo of a ficus, and that is the jungle garden at the Huntington. Um, and that's where I went on my field placement, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But um, again, it's a garden that has lots of different parts and, and any one of its collections would be uh, could amount to a garden somewhere else, um, the Australian garden, the desert garden, jungle garden. Uh, there's there's loads of the palm garden any of them um and so that that really stood out and the benign california climate what what you can grow is just uh, astonishing um and so this was another part of the huntington where i went and spent uh, two lovely months and worked on the uh, ranch garden which is on the right hand side um, and there I sort of worked with the leadership team to, to on some strategic development of that area, um, moving it on. So it's it's a relatively new part of the garden, uh, created in 2010, I think, um, and just in need of some, some rethinking and repurposing. And on the left is a photo from uh, their desert collection, um, the succulent collection. Um, which is uh, just as someone who used to run a succulent nursery and, and have to overwinter things in polytunnels, it was just uh, just jaw dropping uh, to experience it. Um, and where next? So I'm back in Cornwall um, at a garden called Travince Estate, and it's a 25 acre estate, four acre woodland garden, a one acre wall garden, um, and a, a small arboretum orchard. And, and really the purpose is to, to reimagine this garden that's at sort of centuries old, um, but to, to give it an, an, a new sense of purpose, direction into, into the future and uh, focus on both organizational sustainability and, and it's the, the ecological aspects of the garden as well. So that's, that's my next mission, um, already stuck into it. Uh, lovely sunny weather today, which makes a difference. Uh, a bit of rubbish weather last week. So getting stuck into that role. Um, and thoroughly enjoying it. And one last plug uh, from Mission to Impact. So if you, you want to take that QR code and uh, check out our work, it's uh, a few months of our endeavor and collective angst. So uh, I think the more people that can make use of it, the better. So get it out into the world. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Colin. Do, do you want to come out of screen share and we'll just... Oh. Um... We'll see if we've got any um, questions. <clears throat> that was that was such a lovely um, roundup from all of you. And and what was so touching is that you know you obviously really got on so well together and and formed you know a, a bond which um, I guess you know is it could 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 not have been that way. I mean it could have not been like that. It could have been something completely different. But how lovely that you that warmth really comes through. What I, a couple of questions I've got and, and before anybody else uh, is um, how many applicants generally do, does Longwood have for this programme? Do you, any idea? You know, from year to year, is it is it hundreds? Is it thousands? Is it? Um... I think all we kind of know is um, what we turn up to when you're shortlisted. And mm -hmm. that I think it was for us, it was eight or nine, but it can mm -hmm. be more typically sort of 10, 11. It can be a bit more. And and if you're shortlisted, you get invited to to go to Longwood for, I think it's three days. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you go through sort of um, right from sort of breakfast one morning to, to dinner and then mm -hmm. giving mm -hmm. presentations and all sorts of things. Um, yeah. You feel like you've deserved it if you, if you get offered the place. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Well, Does anyone else know anything about the total numbers? No. Really? No, I can't. I, I mean, I imagine it would be so, um, you know, highly sought after. Um, the other question I, think I there was once, maybe once I, I when I was over a conversation, we heard like about 60, a little bit of under 100 was. Right. Okay. That's interesting. Number, but we don't know that for sure. It's not a public information. Yeah, yeah. 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 The other question I've got is that the on your placements, Am I right in thinking that some of you, it, you were in a sort of observation, more of an observational role, but some of you were getting stuck into actually, you know, uh, working with the team? Is that that's correct? Is it so? It, it could be observational, or it could be that you're absolutely thrown in at the deep end. Is that right? 
think we all did a, a bit of both where yeah. we were kind of shadowing and observing to even you know really understand what was going on at the organization but I feel like we all had some sort of active participation that we were focused on to kind of really make sure the experience was rich for ourselves as well as the organization that we were staying oh, that, that's at. interesting and yeah. Abby while while I've got you on I'm interested to know why you chose Annick Gardens you know yeah. it was an interesting choice but what what was it that really you know drew you to Annick they have a core value of being quirky, which I absolutely loved. <laughs> and as well as their focus on social impact. Like I really wanted to see that activated role of an organization involved in the community. And one of the big moments that stood out for me is was a um a action meeting within the town that had community leaders as well and town council members and the local law enforcement that the garden, the community and education director was um, chairing that meeting. So I think really seeing that active role of an organization was what drew me to visit that and stay there. That, yeah, yeah. And and interesting that Chanticleer scored so highly with everybody. <laughs> I'm very I will let them know that next week when I'm when I'm there. And also two gardens that I'd love to see is one is Bartram's. I've never, all the times that the years I've been going to to Chanticleer, I've never made it to Bartram's. Um, and coastal Maine as well. That's cropped up a couple of play- at times, and and again, that you know, like, that's somewhere that oh, would would be wonderful, wonderful to go. Um, very big mosquitoes at coastal Maine. They're yeah, well, big. I did work in a in a summer camp once in Maine uh, many many moons ago, teaching riding, and the, I remember those mosquitoes. <laughs> They were like zeppelins. Um, right. So there is a question for you, Colin, actually. Yeah. Um, it says, thank you for sharing your time as fellows. It's fantastic to hear a small slice of what you all did, which I absolutely agree with. Question for Colin. What made you choose the fellows program over the RHS Masters of Hort or, or something similar? Good question. Um, I, it wasn't either or. I did the RHSM Hort uh, a couple mm-hmm. of years before I uh, applied for the Longwood Fellows program. Um so I would say, um, and that was part of a journey to realizing that actually, um, you know, as someone who came up through as a horticulturalist into more management roles, mm-hmm. um, that you realize that as well, you know, as well as growing plants, you've got to, you know, grow teams, grow people, and it's people work. And, mm. and so you realize, hey, maybe some training on this, maybe spending some time on myself in this area is going to gonna be really something that's, that's going to gonna make a difference. So mm-hmm. that was the thinking behind it. So not either or, um, as, as well as really. Yeah, but, yeah. Okay, okay. And whereabouts in Cornwall is Trevince? Where where are so you? It's it's uh, Gwenap, so near oh, Red right. Ruth. It's okay, large okay, town. okay. Yeah. Great, fantastic. Um, and I do urge people to that's go good. back. Um, I mean, this will go up onto YouTube. You'll, uh, the recording will be out there um, to go back and, and check the QR code because um, your mission statement uh, document is really interesting. And my goodness me, it shows the work that you all did and you all put into it. So really quite something. Um, so I, I'm sure you must be all really proud of it. It's a fantastic achievement. Um I'm, oh, sorry. I've got. I'm looking after a puppy. Hence the hence the noises in the background here. Um, and also very exciting. I'm I'm not sure. Noel's had to leave, but I'm not sure we've actually had a speaker from Africa before. But I can tell you, we've not had anyone from Ghana before. So thank you very much. That's really exciting to be to be um, live in Africa tonight. Um, great. I think I'm not sure. Ah, oh, no, no. I think I've I think I've done all my questions, and I'm not sure. Oh, Susan Ryan saying uh, I have a friend to share the program with i mean i'm sure i i can't imagine you know that people are not flocking to do this program it's such a fantastic opportunity and um it's it's amazing how times whiz by because it's only a year ago colin i was sat with you having supper in way yes. and and you've not long started it and it was like well this is going to be an exciting year so um to, to you know and i kept saying well, as soon as you finished it we must have you all on to talk about it so um yeah what a lovely lovely opportunity a lucky you what a, what a lucky group um and and i want to say thank you so much for all coming together putting this communal um document together you know and giving us your insights but also all, all the different time zones that we've crossed this evening um thank you for giving up your your precious time as for some of you it's still only in the middle of the day um but it's been wonderful and i'm you know really really envious and excited to hear about it i think what a, what an opportunity 
absolutely fantastic. So I hope we'll we'll hear more and more from all of you about where you are and what you're doing over the next um, few years. And keep in touch with Garden Masterclass. Tell us what you're up to. What's the what's the next stage? It'd be really exciting. Yeah. Thank, thank you very you much for the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. That's all right. That's all right. But thank thank you all thank so you. much. And um, hopefully, yeah, let's keep in touch. Tell us what you're up to. It would be really lovely to have a, a one year on the one year down the line. That would be good, wouldn't it, Colin? Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna put, I have no uh, doubts. I'm going to put that ball in your court, Colin. So next July, <laughs> or maybe okay. someone else should take over. But wouldn't that be nice? Where are they all now? Okay. <laughs> lovely. Brilliant. That's well, a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Let's do it. Let's say let's, let's make a date. Anyway, listen, thank you so much, all of you. Um, it's been great. And uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully, Colin, see you before too long, I hope. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yep. Okay. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Yes. Bye. 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 Uh, we hope that you are enjoying this uh, bit recording from uh, Garden Masterclass's Thursday Garden Chat program. Uh, we started doing this uh, in April 2020 uh, during the first COVID lockdown when we did it uh, five days a week for two months, which was a, a wonderful experience. Um, since then, we've carried on doing it just for one uh, session a week. We have always done this as a public service. Uh, we initially started it as a morale booster for the garden and landscape industry during a very difficult time. And we've so loved doing it um, that we've carried on doing this. But our presenters give their time for free. We give our time for free. We do incur costs, uh, administrative, technical, and sometimes for support staff. Uh, and we would very much appreciate the odd donation uh, to uh, help us keep going and help keep this a, a free service, which we'd very much like to do. So please go to our homepage and down at the bottom there, there's a donate button and we'll be very grateful. Thank you.